It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search it out is the glory of kings. This is the Message to Kings podcast. Episode 192, The Assyrian Empire at its Height and the Prophet Nahum. Even as Manasseh and Ammon ruled in Judah, a lot is going on in the world around them as the Assyrian Empire rises to the heights of its conquest and at the top of its game. Assyria receives a word about its future. We all know Hezekiah successfully resisted the Assyrians and Sennacherib lost his army, his life, and his throne. And the Assyrian Empire was thrown into total disorder on the night of the Angel of Death. But in a matter of 15 years, the Assyrian Empire was again put back together in order by an authoritative ruler and a successor which not only stabilized Assyria, but expanded its empire to new heights. After the death of Hezekiah, even as Manasseh was having his party days in sin in Jerusalem, a new ruler came to power in Assyria. His name was Esar Haddon. He ruled for the next 12 years, putting back together pieces of the kingdom that rebelled, and then focused on ending the conflict with the rebellious Babylon and their eternal enemy, Egypt. Here are some accounts of what he did. We use a lot of Assyrian write-ups using the words of the kings of Assyria themselves to describe what they did. First, he conquered Sidon, a Phoenician city. This is what he commemorated about the conquest. I besieged, I captured, I plundered, I destroyed, I devastated, I burned with fire. I hung the heads of the kings upon the shoulders of their nobles, and with singing and music I paraded. Next, I attacked Tyre and took it. At this stage, he probably captured Manasseh, who was forced to help him build a palace in Assyria eventually. With his submitted Tyre, Babylon, and Judah, he was free to pursue his ultimate aim, Egypt. With Egypt as target, it states he swiftly seized upon the Nile. This is what it states from the Serge Stele. Esar had and wrote, From the town of Ashupri, as far as Memphis, his royal rev- residence, a distance of 15 days march, I fought daily without interruption, very bloody battles, against Terhaka, king of Egypt and Ethiopia, the one accursed by all the great gods. Five times I hit him with the point of my arrows, inflicting wounds from which he should not recover. And then I laid siege to Memphis, his royal residence, and conquered it a half day by means of mines, breaches, and assault ladders. I destroyed it, tore down its walls, and burned it down. After many bloody battles, he appointed his own governors and rulers who were despised by the Egyptian elite. As he left, he failed to reserve enough of an army to keep order, needing his troops elsewhere. And this is where we're going to find Assyria isn't going to be able to sustain their empire of torture. Typically, Assyria fielded a huge army, and they led it on campaign and inflicted exorbitant damage on its enemies, and tortured and burned and looted so much of the enemy territory that they typically refused to fight back for years. These years away allowed the Assyrians to take their huge army to campaign it in a different direction. It wasn't a two-front empire, and the Assyrians were miserable at the leave your garrison in the enemy capital thing. Assyria's army failed when it was forced to fight on two fronts. The U.S. excelled at it in World War II, while Germany failed at it at the same war. Assyria was not a two-front empire, and few in world history could pull it off. Alexander the Great conquered his empire with just one army, and I don't remember him ever splitting his forces except for in specific battlefield engagements. The Romans were an empire that could advance with multiple armies on multiple fronts, though they typically didn't do it often, but they had the logistics to pull it off. Few nations are capable of this. Assyria sent everything into Egypt to take Egypt, neglecting the rest of its empire. The fact that the angel of death destroyed over 180,000 troops tells us Assyria truly believed in one army to destroy them all. So geopolitically, here's the picture. Fortunately for Assyria, there was a complacent, happy-to-be-alive Manasseh refusing to fight against them. Babylon was crushed, but rising again to fight against Assyria. Tyre and Sidon and Aram were broken. The future Persian nations were rising up as well. 
It's the being as far away as Egypt that aroused the other nations to rebel against the tyrant. Napoleon was another guy who couldn't fight on multiple fronts successfully. It was the Spanish ulcer that drained him of his resources. Esar had in left Egypt enriched by the spoils, but he wouldn't have a faithful tax network. He'd be enriched by a trade dominance, but this wouldn't last. His successor, Ashurbanipal, would reign 41 years, and when Egypt rebelled against him, he was ruthless, inflicting one of the worst destructions on Egypt it ever experienced. Here's an inscription by the king of Assyria himself. In my second campaign, I made straight for Egypt and Ethiopia. Tartamani heard of the advance of my army and that I was invading the territory of Egypt. He forsook Memphis and fled for his life. As a demonstration of their power, the Egyptians removed statues or objects of worship of their conquered foes, or anything that represented the crown or spiritual forces behind it. In this case, the statue of Amun from Karnak was sent to Nineveh. The year was 664 BC, and this is the last time Assyria invades Egypt. Enriched by the spoils, but overstretched as an empire, Assyria was about to feel the weight of another multiple front campaign of rising nations to challenge their power. As Ashurbanipal marched his enriched army back to Nineveh through Judah, Manasseh watched the Assyrians and considered their power and wondered to what heights and power would this empire grow to. Little did he know, unless he was a student of prophecy, that Assyria's days were numbered. At its height, overlording the earth from Persia to Egypt through conquest and terror, the Assyrians dominated the landscape. Leaving Egypt, Ashurbanipal appoints a puppet ruler, Samtik I, over Egypt. This actual puppet ruler would go on to rebel against Assyria ten years after his appointment. Assyria, consumed by rebellions everywhere, would never attack Egypt proper again. Regarding this Samtik I, he would have a son named Pharaoh Necho, who will become quite a ruler known for commissioning a navigation around the Horn of Africa, for killing one of Judah's kings, and entering into Israel's sphere of influence quite heavily. An aggressive and productive king, he will start the 26th dynasty of Egypt that will rule until the Persians. So now we come to the year 654 BC, and Manasseh's long rule will continue another four years. His son Ammon will rule after him for a very short while, mm. and Josiah will follow. Upon the rebellion of Elam and Babylon, Egypt rebels as well um, against the Assyrian Empire. There's a lot going on internally in Nineveh that changes the course for Assyria, which leads to three multiple rebellions against Assyria. Ashurbanipal, the king of Assyria, for the next 40 years, will start to conduct very un-Assyrian behavior, distancing himself from the military, acting with paranoia. He even conducted multiple mass executions within his own government just to keep his power. And there's a lot of internal kind of chaos going on in Nineveh, which is not unheard of for the Assyrian Empire, but it's at this stage where it's going on for some time, and Assyria is the dominant force, and this instability invites rebellion and any weakness because the terror that they invite is in this, this terror that they wrought in the countrysides and in these other countries and states is causing this rebellion elsewhere. Whenever there's a weakness and there's their armies distance themselves, people rise up because, you know, terror can only control so long. You know, fear has such a dominance, but it's not going to last. It's primarily the paranoia and the world being fed up with Assyria and the lack of attention to the provinces, uh, the, the military generals running their terror campaigns in the provinces, the exhaustion of the kingdoms under Assyria, the overstretching of its military and lack of energy displayed fighting off threats, which invited a full-out rebellion and the freedom of nations to rise up and new leaders to end the threat of Assyria once and for all. Into the reign of King Josiah, around when the, he finds the law and the revival breaks out, Ashurbanipal has died, and there's a succession crisis, and which further allows disorganization inside Assyria and inviting more enemies of Assyria to rise. In 623 BC, the Babylonians conducted a full-out rebellion during the succession crisis. 
Babylon, which rebelled every few years, it seems like, at this time had a popular, successful, charismatic leader named Nabopolassar, who will start the Neo-Babylonian kingdom, and whose son will be none other than Nebuchadnezzar, a Bible lore. He'll rise up and aggressively eject the Assyrians from surrounding territories, not just Babylon, but its region, and push back so hard and successfully against the Assyrians, others will join, including kingdoms from Persia, Zyaxeres from Persia, who will have a descendant himself named Cyrus. The rise of nation-states and future empires is occurring, and the time of Assyrians' world dominance is coming to an end. To conclude this episode of Message to Kings, we're going to introduce three minor prophets and the prolific Jeremiah. In the upcoming reign of Josiah, the prophets are rebirthed. In fact, four of them conduct recorded prophecies, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Nahum. Nahum's focus is the Assyrians. Since we're covering the Assyrians, let's give an overview of his words about Assyria and what is ahead for this dreaded empire. What's going to happen to them? Will Assyria just bounce back again and reinvade Egypt and have another powerful king or even have a revival like the time of Jonah? To answer this question, we look at the words of prophecy. Though they don't reveal timelines and dates, they do foretell the future. Here's what the prophet Nahum says about Assyria. Nahum 1, the prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. It continues, Nahum 1.12. This is what the Lord says. Although they have, may have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and pass away. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and idols that are in the temples of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. Look, there are the mountains. The feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you, and they will be completely destroyed. An attacker advances against you, Nineveh. Guard the fortress, watch the road, brace yourselves, marshal all your strength. The Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob, like the splendor of Israel. Though destroyers have laid them waste and have ruined their vines, the shields of the soldiers are red, the warriors are clad in scarlet, the metal on the chariots flashes on the day they were made ready. The spears of juniper are brandished. The chariots storm through the streets, rushing back and forth through the squares. They look like flaming torches. They dart about like lightning. Nineveh summons her picked troops, but yet they are stumbling on their way. They dash to the city wall. The protective shield is put in place. The river gates are thrown open and the palace collapses. It is decreed that Nineveh be exiled and carried away. Her female slaves moan like doves and beat on their breasts. Nineveh is like a pool whose water is draining away. Stop, stop, they cry, but no one turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. The supply is endless. The wealth from all its treasures. She is pillaged, plundered, stripped. Hearts melt, knees give way. Bodies tremble, every face grows pale. Where now is the lion's den, the place where they feed their young? Where the lion and lioness went, and the cubs with nothing to fear. The lion killed enough for his cubs and strangled the prey for his mate filling his lairs with the kill and his dens with the prey. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will burn up your chariots in smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. I will leave you no prey on the earth. The voices of your messengers will no longer be heard. So that's a lot on the prophet Nahum. I mean, he is just blistering. His entire focus is the destruction of the civilization of Assyria. So I'm going to just read the rest because it sets the tone for the fall of his civilization. We don't know that much about Nahum, but he sure was accurate about what is to come. 
in Assyria. Nahum 3. Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims, the crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolting chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses, all because of the wanton lust of a prostitute alluring the mistress of sorceries, who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will pelt you with filth. I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. All who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins. Who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? Are you better than Thebes, situated on the Nile with water around her? The river was her defense, the waters her wall. Cush and Egypt were her boundless strength. Put and Libya were among her allies. Yet she was taken away captive and went into exile. Her infants were dashed to pieces at every street corner. Lots were cast for her nobles, and all her great men were put in chains. You too will be become drunk and you will go into hiding and seek refuge from the enemy. All your fortresses are like fig trees with their first ripe fruit. When they are shaken, the figs fall into the mouth of the eater. Look at your troops. They are all weaklings. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has consumed the bars of your gates. Draw water for the siege. Strengthen your defenses. Work the clay. Tread the mortar. Repair the brickwork. There the fire will consume you. The sword will cut you down. They will devour you like a swarm of locusts. Multiply like grasshoppers. Multiply like locusts. You have increased the number of your merchants till they were more numerous than the stars in the sky. But like locusts, they strip the land and then fly away. Your guards are like locusts. Your officials like swarms of locusts. They settle in the walls on a cold day. But when the sun appears, they fly away and no one knows where. King of Assyria, your shepherds slumber, your nobles lie down to rest, your people are scattered on the mountains with no one to gather them. Nothing can heal you. Your wound is fatal. All who hear the news about you clap their hands at your fall. For who has not felt your endless cruelty? So the question is not whether it will happen, but when. A time will come when Assyria will be no more and no longer a nation, and her violence will no longer threaten the earth. The destroyer of kings and kingdoms, the destroyer of northern Israel will be no more. God has spoken, and this time will come to pass. The end of an empire is coming, and it's not because of man or some strategy or the brilliance of his enemies. No, it's because the Lord has decreed it to be, and he has empowered the enemies of Assyria, to rise up and to deal with Assyria. Per the Assyrians, the source of their power was the superiority of their gods. If this is the case, it is their gods or empowered dark forces that must be dealt with, and the abandonment of man's worship that empowered evil that must be dealt with as well. In this age, we find armies and nations are defeated, and with it their temples and monuments to their gods are destroyed, tearing down the spiritual stronghold, empowering the nation as well. Looking at history in this time, this is what we see. The temples of Asher and Nineveh will become the targets of destruction of the enemies of Assyria. In the next episode, we'll cover Josiah and the other events before we return to the coalition of nations and kings against Assyria. It's not the first time kings have allied themselves against Assyria, but this time we have an actual offensive that appears to be gathering serious momentum. It's not a defensive movement, you know, to keep the Assyrians out. It's actually going to take the offensive. So we'll need to introduce our characters of the age more thoroughly a bit later. When I was a teenager, I remember the excitement of when the Berlin Wall was toppled, when the Soviet Union came to an end. It was a climactic event that reshaped global politics and geopolitical forces. The Cold War ended. The Western powers were victorious, and the scary Soviet Union 
was no longer posing a threat to the West. If Assyria's end is coming, what is the world going to look like? Where is biblical history heading? I mean, for how many hundreds of years was the Assyrians the scary, dark forces from the north? The answer is, we're headed into an age of prophets and empires. Prophets and kings are coming to an end in favor of a season and empire where prophets have a voice with secular world leaders, and the prophets of God speak and have unbelievable favor with worldly kings or emperors of the earth, where the prophets in this time find themselves in positions of power far beyond anything the kings of Israel or even Solomon ever experienced. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Message to Kings. Feel free to visit the website, messagetokings.com, share the Facebook page, or if you want to chat, email us at messagetokings at gmail.com.